I'm back for potentially the last time for Skyhawk. We are really close mm. to the mm. end. So, if you just tuned in for the last one, we found out that they were trying to raise money to help bring Geneva to Scotland because the three boys want to help her be able to soar like Iris. So poor Geneva needs an operation on her legs. Um, it could be a life-saving operation. And the boys feel a lot of empathy for the situation. And despite the success of finding Iris, want to do something to make a difference for Geneva as well. So they raise lots of money for the flight to Scotland and are hoping they can change her life for her. Chapter 35. By five o'clock, the village hall was empty. There were some boxes of books and a bag of old clothes left. But we had sold most of the stuff. Mum made a fresh pot of tea and we sat down to finish the rest of the cakes and total up the money. There were piles of it, coins stacked up and bags of notes. Rob and his dad joined us right at the end. Well, the grand total is, said Hamish with a big grin, 1,000 four hundred and sixty two pounds and eight pence all the adults cheered but i didn't it wasn't enough we'd found out at the end of the week that it wasn't that simple to just fly geneva out here she wasn't british so her treatment would have to be paid for and it would cost tens of thousands of pounds i went to sit on the same table with rob and ewan it's a start said rob we can raise more. I nodded. I didn't want Rob to think he'd sold his bike for nothing. It's sold then, said Rob. I'm sorry, I said. Ewan was shaking his head in disbelief. I still can't believe you did it, he said. I mean, that bike was part of you. What will you do without the wheels? Rob slumped further in his seat. I've still got legs, he said, almost with half a smile. <laughs> I guess I'll have to take up running instead. It was dark by the time we'd cleared the hall and put the chairs away. We walked out into the car park while Mum locked up the village hall. Ewan nudged me. Over there, he said. I looked across the road. Under the street lamp stood Mr McNair with Rob's bike. Rob noticed too, but kept his head down and followed his dad to the car. Mr McNair wheeled the bike over to us and stared at Rob from under his bushy eyebrows. There was an awkward silence. Mr McNair didn't take his eyes off Rob, though. So, you're Rob, the boy with the mean mouth and the big wheels, he said. Mean mouth and no manners. That's what I once heard. Mr McNair was so close to us. I could see the spidery veins across the white of his eyes and the lined, bristly skin on his face. Rob glanced at his bike and then back at the ground. Come on, said Rob's dad, pulling Rob away. Mr McNair pushed the bike closer, almost touching Rob. The tick, tick, tick of the turning wheels sounded loud in the silence. It seems, he said, you've got your manners back. Rob turned to look at him. Mr, Burnett, Mr. McNair glared at him gruffly. You'd better have your bike back too. It's no use to me. He pushed the bike into Rob's hands and patted the plastic bag with Ewan's fish. I'll keep those though. It's a long time since I had a bit of fresh trout. He took the bag under his arm and shuffled away up the dark street. Wait, called Mum. Mr McNair, maybe I could cook those trout for you with a bit of parsley and butter. Mr McNair turned and nodded. Aye, Mrs McGregor, that would be grand. I glanced at Rob. He was speechless. You'll have to ride home now, said Dad. Rob grinned big and wide. He swung his leg over the bike and circled round the car park, shooting up and down the grassy banks. Watch out, I yelled. A car shot into the car park and screeched to a stop beside us, headlights full on, blaring. A young woman, blonde and smartly dressed, opened the door. Is this the village hall? she asked. Dad nodded. She smiled at all of us. I'm looking for Callum McGregor, she said. Everyone looked in my direction. That's me, I said. She held out a hand. Karen Burroughs, she said. I heard there's a village fair here. 
I'm afraid it's finished, I said. You've just missed it. Oh, she raised her eyebrows. No matter. I'm from the Highland Chronicle. I want to write a piece on your fundraising. I knew the Highland Chronicle. It was the local paper for the area, with local news and events and adverts. I'm sorry, but you're just a bit late, I said. It's not that, she said. She reached into the car for her notepad and voice recorder. She smiled at me, a sort of smile, and held known secrets. It's just that I heard you raise money for an African girl. I nodded, but deep knot tightened in the pit of my stomach. And, she said, it's all because of an osprey you saved here in Scotland. Is that true? So after Callum and Iona wanting to keep the osprey a secret for eternity, even against the odds, do we now think that Callum will share the secret of the Osprey in order to help Geneva to get the, by getting the news and fundraiser further afield? Chapter 36 How did that reporter know all about the Osprey? I said. We told no one. We stood in the village hall car park, watching the taillights of Karen Burrow's car disappear up the road. Ewan glanced at his dad. Then at me. I think it was me, he said. I didn't mean to. I was talking about the fundraising to one of the people who deliver the papers to Dad's shop. I said the Gambian girl had found an osprey, but I never said it was from here. I hardly mentioned it. Well, that woman's going to put it in the papers next week, I said. Hamish stepped between us. She doesn't know where you live, he said. Not yet, I said. I bet we'll soon have people snooping all over the farm. Once Iris comes back, she'll never be safe again. It's only a local rag running the story, said Dad. It's not like it's going to be national news. Well, it only takes one person to steal the eggs, I snapped. Dad opened the car door. Come on, let's go home. It's been a long day. The Chronicle ran the story on Monday. Dad showed me the paper when I got home from school. I was relieved to see it wasn't on the front page. It was a small article near the middle of the paper showing a picture of an osprey and the poster Rob had made. See, said Dad, blink and you'll miss it. I suppose you're right, I said. I'm always right, Dad said with a grin. I tapped in Iris' code on the computer. I wanted to tell her it was safe to come back. I wanted her to come back here to the farm. I checked on her every day now. It was as if keeping that connection kept her alive, as if she knew I was there, watching her. She was still in the Gambia, near the coast. The photo showed long, wide, sandy beaches and river deltas with mangrove forest. Her signal had crisscrossed the same river inlet for nearly a week, Hamish said the first week after release was the hardest. It was make or break, but Iris had made it. She was still flying, still hunting. She was alive. I missed her. I hadn't been to look at the ivy for ages. I promised myself I would get up early the next day and go and check it for storm damage. It was an excuse to go up there, really. After a week of organising the fundraising fair, I just wanted some time alone, up on the hills. I put out my fleece jacket and thick socks, and I set for the alarm at 6.30. I woke before the alarm. It was still dark outside and silent. Fern patterns of frost sparkled on the window in the light of a half moon. I got up, dressed in several layers of clothes, and went down to the kitchen. It was warm from the heat of the cooking range. I tore off a piece of bread from the loaf Mum had left out, put on my boots and slipped out into the yard. The lights were on in one of the barns. Dad was up already, checking on the sheep. I heard the rustle of straw as Kip came out to meet me. His tail thumped on the wooden sides of the kennel, his breath misted white in the cold air. Come on then, I said. I leaned down to unclip his chain and ruffled my hands through his thick winter coat. He licked my face and barked. I put my hand over his muzzle. Shh, Kip, no noise. As if he understood, he padded silently ahead of me, out of the yard and up the track leading to the lock. I loved the farm before the dawn. It was a totally different place. Frost crusted puddles, frost crusted puddles reflected the moonlight and lit up the path. The outline of hills was soft and dark, like waves on a midnight sea, and the woods were a smudge of blackness so deep it looked impossible to enter. There were no colours, only the deepness of blue. I was out of breath by the time I reached the lock. The moon was shining white ball in the water. I couldn't make out the ivory very well. It was almost hidden from the ground. If you didn't know it was there, you'd definitely miss it. I thought of going to the treehouse just to look, but I couldn't do it. Iona and I never did get to sleep the night up there. 
I sat down on a flat rock jutting out over the lock and chewed on the piece of bread from my pocket. A pale light was spreading across the eastern sky and the night farm was fading. Colours slowly merged into the day and the pale greens of the fields, peaty browns of the lock and strips of promised sunlight disappeared beneath the clouds. Me and my owner and I would have sat here on this rock and watched a dawn just like this. Maybe. I threw Kip the crust. Come on, I said. <coughs> I've got school and you've got work to do with Dad today. I jumped down from the rock and whistled to Kip. But he was standing almost still, staring into the valley below, his ears pricked. Come on, Kip, I said. He followed me down the path by the river, but stopped again. A low growl built in his throat and his hackles were raised. Kip saw the man before I did. We hardly ever had walkers and ramblers on our farm, not at this time in the morning anyway. We met in a corner where the bend was steep, small loose stones skittered under the man's feet. Hello, he said. He had a southern accent. He smiled if he was expecting to meet me here. Callum McGregor, isn't it? I nodded. He held up his camera. It was one of those big ones with a huge lens. Do you mind if I take your photo? I'm doing a feature on the Osprey you saved. I could feel Kit press against my leg. I've got to go, I said. I've lost some sheep. I pushed past him and ran down the track. When I turned around at the bottom of the hill, I could see him coming down the track too. I ran on as fast as I could back home. I had to tell Mum and Dad and Hamish. I had to tell them there was someone snooping on the farm. I burst into the yard. Mum was grim-faced by the back door. You and Dad had just been on the phone, she said. There are TV cameras and journalists swarming all over the village. It's you they want to talk to. We'd better get down there. So the media are flying in to help spread the tale. Will it be help or will it be a hindrance? Callum definitely seems to think it will be a hindrance. Brings a lot of similarities to the impact of media in Pig Heart Boy. Maybe you could think about the contrast and the differences the media had on the two stories. Chapter 37. Dad pulled up in the road behind the village hall. We could see the car park was full of camera crews and journalists. Mrs Wicklow was standing in the back entrance of the village hall, beckoning us in. Mum, Dad, Graham and I scrambled over the back fence and into the village hall. It looked as if everyone from the village was crammed in there. I could hear reporters knocking at the door. It's big news, said Ewan's dad. Seems everyone wants to know. He shook his head. There are more reporters on the way here. There's even a television crew from CNN. It's world news now. I'm sorry, said Ewan. Mrs Wicklow put her hand on my arm. We won't tell them about the osprey on your farm. I looked around at the faces staring at me. Oh, so everyone knows, do they? I may as well take the reporters up to the lock now. But they don't know where the nest is, said Ewan. And none of us are going to show them, said Rob's dad. I glared at every single one of them. It won't take them long to work out where she is. Iris will never be safe again. Just then, there was a splintering sound and the doors were flung open. Reporters and cameramen surged into the hall. Ewan caught me by the arm. Don't say a word, he advised. Rob and I have got a plan. Wait for us. Do not say a word. There he is. I watched them push their way through the crowd and come towards me. I turned to see the tall reporter I'd met on the hill striding towards me first. He held out a hand. Here's the boy who could tell us all about it. I backed away. Suddenly all the cameras were pointing at me. About ten people were asking questions all at once. Everything seemed to slow down and speed up at the same time. I could hear Mum calling me from the back of the crowd. She sounded really far away. A woman took me gently by the arm and led me outside. This way, Callum, she smiled. I followed her, squeezing through jackets, coats and cameras. I found myself standing in front of a TV camera, next to the smiling lady. We're going on live TV, she said. Everyone wants to know your remarkable story. The cameras were running and she was talking, and I was telling her about Geneva, about the fundraising to pay for her operation over here, and about the Gambian villagers finding the osprey from the satellite signals in the mangrove forests. And this osprey, she said, still smiling. How did you get to know about this osprey? My mouth went dry. I stalled. There were microphones all pointing at me. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a truck screech into the car park. I saw Robin, Ewan and Hamish running towards me. It all seemed to be happening in slow motion. This osprey, she said, smiling. Did you find it here, in this valley? I opened my mouth to speak as Hamish wrapped his arm around me and stepped in front of the camera. No, Hamish said, Callum and his friends here have been following one of the ospreys at the nature reserve where I work. We had a breeding pair there last summer. As you know, they're endangered birds. We have CCTV and razor wire to protect them. And if you'd all like to come with me to the reserve, I can show you the rest and the nest right now. I sank into a chair. I felt exhausted. The last of the reporters' cars had left the yard, following Hamish on the 15-mile trip to the nature reserve. Mum made cups of tea for everyone from the village, and soon it became a bit of an early morning party. Rob's dad gave me a pat on the back. The osprey on your farm is our secret too. We all stick together for something like this. How did everyone know, though? I said. No one did until today, said Rob's dad, but Mr McNair saw the journalist arrive early this morning. He saw, a report, he saw a reporter heading up the lock and guessed the osprey nest was up there. Mr McNair told Mrs Beattie at the post office and she told everyone else. That's why we all came here, to stop the reporters snooping about your farm. We told them you were with us. It was a close one, said Rob. Ewan was pale. We almost didn't make it. How did he know, I said. How did Mr McNair know about the ospreys on our farm? Mum put a cup of tea on the table beside me and sat down. He found a box of Iona's things, her drawings and pictures. He remembered his father telling him there were once ospreys in the valley too. I'm guessing he put two and two together. Rob's mum arrived at the hall with some bacon and eggs. I may as well make your breakfast, she said. You're late for school already. I don't think another half an hour will hurt. We were finishing our bacon and eggs when a car arrived at the village hall. The tall reporter I'd met before came through the door. Mum started cleaning the ketchup, clearing the ketchup and brown sauce bottles away. They've all got school now, I'm afraid, she said. The man took out his mobile and scrolled through his messages. I just need to check a few things with Callum. That's all. Well, he's not got long, so be quick. Mum pulled on her coat and picked up a handbag. The man smiled at her. I just need to check the charity number for Geneva. Our news desk has already received donations of money towards her treatment in the UK. Mum sat down clutching her, her handbag. How much money are we talking here? The reporter scrolled through the messages again. Well, it's only an hour since the newscast went out, but there are donations already in the region of about £10,000. I almost choked on my bacon. 10000 Yep, said the man. He scrolled down the messages again. Oh, and there's an orthopaedic surgeon in London, mad keen on birds. He's offered to do the operation for free. Chapter 38. More money came in over the rest of the day, and the following days after that. People from all over the world gave money from Canada, Japan, France and America. One of the newspapers paid for someone to be in charge of the charity for Geneva, and arrange a trip over here. It all happened so quickly. It was out of our hands, out of our control. There were photos of Geneva in the Gambian hospital bed, photos of the village and the river. My words and the story had been changed from magazine and newspaper articles. Geneva was suddenly everyone else's friend, everyone else's property. I was happy for her, but I felt like I'd lost her. She hadn't answered any emails. I had to find out what was happening from the newspapers. Just be patient, said Mum. She probably feels the same way, too. Suddenly, everyone's changing things for her in her life. Everybody else is in charge. She's been sick, remember? I waited, and I needn't have worried. Geneva sent an email. From Geneva Carr. Sent 1st of December, 1330. Subject. Flying like Iris. Hello, Callum. I am sorry I have not written. It has taken much time to clear the infection in my leg, but I am well to travel now. When Dr Jawara told me I was going to Britain to mend my leg, I could not believe it. I cannot thank your village enough for helping me. I keep thinking, maybe the marabout is wrong this time. Maybe his dream of me walking across the ocean of clouds will not come true. Maybe I really will walk again. There have been lots of journalists here too. Mama Binta says they are the worst. They're worse than the village goats just wandering into the hospital when they like. But I like them. 
They are funny. They bring books and pens and toys. Everything has happened so fast. Tomorrow I fly to London. I am so excited. No one from the village has been in an aeroplane before. I need a nurse to travel with me, so Mama Binter is coming too. Dr Jawara said he feels sorry for all the British doctors. I think Mama Binter heard, because Dr Jawara has been hiding from her all day. It is also a sad day tomorrow, because Max is going back to America. We are having a party for him today. Max gave me his medical books. He said I'm going to need them when I am a doctor, and I will be a doctor one day. Callum, I will. The money you raised is enough to send me to school and then college. I've never seen Mama Binter smile as big as she did when she found out. Mama Binter says she always wanted to be a doctor. I think she would have been the best doctor too. Maybe I can come and see you in Scotland. Is it far from London? I would love to see the mountains and the rivers in your photos. I hope I will see Iris again one day too. Your friend, Geneva. Chapter 39 the next few months went by so fast. At Christmas, people from the village sent Mama Binta and Geneva clothes and books. Mama Binta phoned us to say Geneva was doing well, but had had four operations on her leg already and was very tired most of the time. I'd sent a Christmas card and a letter, but it wasn't until New Year that I got a letter back from her. This time it's a handwritten letter. All the others previously have been emails. Obviously handwritten is in text form, but it's handwritten. 4th of January Happy New Year, Callum. I am writing from my hospital bed. I don't have a computer, so I can't email you. But maybe when I am strong enough, Mama Binter can take me to the internet cafe on the street below my window. Please thank the people from your village for the kind gifts. Mama Binter was very happy with the jumpers you sent. She finds England so cold. She's wearing all three of the jumpers at the same time. We had a great surprise at New Year. Max came to see us. He is staying with friends in London. He says Scotland is the best place in the world for New Year. He tried to teach us a song called Old Lang Syne, but he only knew the first line. It didn't stop him getting all the doctors and nurses singing and dancing along. Even Mama Binter joined in, and I didn't know she could dance. The streets here are very pretty with bright lights. There is even a flashing reindeer on the shop opposite my room. Mama Binter says she doesn't know if it is day or night in London. She misses the dark skies of home. Today I saw snow. One of the nurses took me outside in the street. I watched it fall from the sky and tried to catch it in my mouth. I was covered all over in big white snowflakes. They landed in my hair and on my face and on my clothes. Close up they look like little stars, millions and millions of them. The nurse told me that not one snowflake is even the same. She said they are all different, all special. Is there snow in Scotland? I hope one day soon I can come and see you. Your friend, Geneva. It didn't snow properly in Scotland until late February. When it did, it was thick and deep. The farm and hills and village were white with it. School was cancelled for nearly a week, and Rob and Ewan and I spent most of the time tobogganing on the hills behind the village. We checked on Iris's position in the Gambia every day. She was still on the same river creek she'd been on for weeks. Then, in the middle of March, when most of the snow had thawed from the hills, leaving only dirty grey patches in the deepest gullies, Iris's signal changed. She left the Gambia and was flying north up along the coastline of Senegal. After all these months in Africa, she was on her way back here, to Scotland. Every chance we got, we followed her journey. We were in the school ICT rooms at most break times and lunch until Mrs Wicklow found us out. We couldn't believe it. When she asked us if we could put Iris's journey up on the whiteboard, so the whole class could follow her too. She'd stop lessons half an hour early so we could look at photos of dawn in the desert, of Berber shepherds in the high Atlas mountains, flocks of birds on estuary mud flats, and cattle grazing green lowland pastures. Hamish was following Iris's journey too. I met him after school one day to check on the Irie up at the lock. The sky was overcast and still. Thin wisps of mist clung to the tops of the pine trees and the oak and wild cherry were bare-leaved, waiting for spring. Iris has left Spain, I said. She's flying in a straight line, north, across the Bay of Biscay. Hamish nodded. I'm surprised she's flying over open water. Ospreys usually come up through France and rest on the way. I guess she's in a hurry to get back to her nest. Will she be OK? I said. Other birds have done that route before. He stopped at the lockside and pulled out his binoculars. She could be here within the week, he said. 
What day do you reckon she'll get here? I asked. But Hamish wasn't listening. His binoculars were fixed on the cluster of pines on the rocky island, and he had a big grin on his face. What is it? I said. Here, he said, passing me the binoculars and pointing across the lock. Take a look at that. Chapter 40 I couldn't wait to tell Geneva what Hamish and I had seen on the lock, and the next day I had my chance. I received an email from Geneva. From Geneva, 31st of March, 2030 GMT. Subject, good news. Hello, Callum. The doctors say I'm strong enough to go out and about now, so Mama Binta has pushed me in my wheelchair to the internet cafe so I can write to you. Mama Binta and I are coming to Scotland tomorrow. I am so excited. It is so sudden, but one of the doctors said he can drive us up to you because he is visiting his family in Scotland for the weekend. I will not get any sleep tonight. I can't stop thinking about meeting you. Your friend, Geneva. Mum! I yelled. Dad! I ran downstairs and jumped the last five steps. Mum! I burst into the kitchen where Mum and Dad were watching TV. They're coming tomorrow night. I've just got an email. Mum jumped up. Tomorrow? Are you sure? I nodded. Heavens! She picked up the telephone. I'd better let everyone know. We've got a party to get ready. I ran back upstairs so I could email Geneva. I was bursting to tell her my news. From Callum. Sent 31st of March 2044 GMT. Subject, Racing Iris. Hello Geneva. That's brilliant. I can't believe you're coming to Scotland tomorrow. Word is spreading around the village and we're having a big party for you and Mama Binta when you get here. I have two bits of good news for you too. Iris's mate is back. Hamish and I saw him yesterday up at the lock, collecting sticks for the nest. I wonder where he spent the winter. Maybe he was in your country too. But now he's back here on the farm. And he's waiting for Iris. And the other great news is about Iris. She's almost here too. She made it to the southwest tip of Ireland this evening. She flew all the way across the sea from Spain. Hamish thinks she got blown off course because ospreys usually come up through France and the south of England. She must be exhausted. She flew non-stop for over 700 miles and it took her less than two days. I've worked out that if she sets out early tomorrow and flies non-stop like she did before, she could be on our farm by 10 tomorrow night. You'd better hurry. She might even beat you here. I can't wait until tomorrow. Callum. P.S. I hope Mama Binter's practised for the Scottish dancing. Chapter 41. The next morning... I rolled out of bed and checked on Iris's position. I grinned, she was on her way. She'd made an early start and was flying up the east coast of Ireland. I ran down the stairs into the kitchen to tell Mum and Dad, but was met by Graham in the hall. I wouldn't go in there if I was you, said Graham. Mum's in panic mode. She's sending me to the shops to get a ton of flour for making cakes. I peered in through the door. There you are, Callum, snapped Mum. She was madly scrubbing the kitchen floor. I hope your room's tidy. You'll need to strip the beds and clean the bathroom. We'll need extra blankets from the attic. And, oh, Graham, haven't you gone yet? Call down, Mum, called Graham. Last minute parties are always the best, trust me. But there's all the food to think about and the music, said Mum. Dad walked in from the yard. It's all sorted. Everyone from the village is bringing some food and drink. The bar will be open. There'll be more than enough. Anne Flint's girlfriend is bringing her band, said Graham. There'll be Scottish dancing and everything. Even Ewan's dad is playing his bagpipes to welcome them in. But, said Mum, trust us, smiled Dad. It'll be fine. We were busy all day. Rob, Ewan and I helped Dad get the village hall ready for the party. We put out tables and chairs, hung bunting from the roof and decorated the stage. More people came in the afternoon to help and deliver food. Ewan's dad practised his bagpipes, and soon there was quite a party happening. Rob got a football match started between the kids and the parents, and even Mrs Wicklow joined in. When everything was finished and done, Dad and I went back home to get changed for the party. You've not got long, said Mum, as we walked through the door. I've just had a quick phone call. Geneva and Mama Binter have made good time. They'll be here within the hour. I rushed upstairs. I felt suddenly so nervous. I hadn't met Geneva face to face before. What if she didn't like me? What if after all this excitement in our village, it was a huge letdown for her? I changed and went down into the kitchen where dad was watching the six o'clock news. He was in his jeans and blue check shirt and was brushing his hair in front of the telly. Come on, said mum, Hamish has given us a lift. I can see him coming up the lane now. I'll just catch the weather, said dad. 
I sat down beside him, jigging my feet under the table. I just couldn't keep still. The weatherman stood in front of the big map of Britain, sweeping his hand across Scotland. Northern Scotland will enjoy a spell of settled weather over the next couple of days, he said. But I can't say the same for the south and west of England. There's a severe weather warning in place for the Bristol Channel and the Irish Sea. Just look at those Isa bars packed together. We can expect gale force wind with those. I stared at the map. It was real time. A storm was moving across the Irish Sea right now. Irish was out there, in those winds, in that storm. I raced up to my room and switched on the computer. Maybe she'd made it ahead of the storm. Maybe she was already sheltering on land somewhere. My heart hammered in my chest. The computer flickered into life. Come on, I said, come on. But there was no signal. None. It was as if she'd vanished off the face of the earth. I tried to block out thoughts of the storm, but all I could see and hear were screaming winds in high, mountainous seas. So just as everything appeared to be coming to a happy ending for everybody involved, including Iris, the male osprey, about to be reunited, Geneva coming up to Scotland and meeting Callum, even though they've got this really close-knitted friendship already. So excitement at its highest, there appears to be one last storm, quite literally, to get past. Iris sensed the storm long before the dark clouds, long before they massed and formed above her. She tilted away from the curling threads of wind, flying hard and fast. But the storm was faster still. It ploughed across the sea, churning it into green-grey troughs and peaks of foam-tipped waves. The storm wind pounded Iris, salt spray clogged of tattered flight feathers. The air and sea were white with foam. It struck it struck her, it hit her to the face and reached deep into the soft, downy layers. She felt heavy, waterlogged. She was flying to stay alive. The waves peaked and crested beneath her in a blur of white street surf. One wave rose beside her, higher than the rest, higher and higher. Its peak curled and tumbled, folding over iris, sealing her in a tube of thundering whiteness. Her wingtips brushed a wall of surf. It broke onto her, pushing her into the sea. Over and over she turned. Salt water rushed into her beak and nostrils. She bobbed up to the surface and shook the water from her head. The straps the humans had tied to her floated loose around her. She clawed at them, pushing them down, down into the water. Irish launched upwards as another wave curled high above her. Her feet still trailed beneath the surface as it came crashing down towards her in a surging mass of surf and foam spray. Chapter 42 We've lost her, I said to Hamish, as he came into the kitchen. There's no signal. I know, he said. I've just checked too. He frowned, the lines on his forehead running into a deep crease. These transmitters are designed to fall off eventually. Sometimes they just go wrong. They stop working. It was working this morning, I said. She's gone, Hamish. She's gone. Hamish gave out a long sigh. All I'm saying is this, he said. We can't give up hope. Not now, not yet. I slumped back into my seat and shook my head. She hasn't made it. Dad put his arms around my shoulders. Come on, he said. I know this is a shock, but we have to get you to the party to welcome Geneva. I nodded and followed them out to Hamish's Land Rover. The hills and fields passed in a blur beside me, and soon Hamish was pulling into the crowded car park of the village hall. Mum turned round and squeezed my hand. Deep breath, she smiled. Do this for Geneva, OK? I stepped out of the car. There you are, Callum, shouted Rob. I turned to see Rob and Ewan pushing their way towards me. Where have you been, said Ewan. You almost didn't make it. Rob's dad's voice shouted over everyone. He was standing on the top of his pickup truck. They're here, he yelled. I can see them coming up the road. Suddenly, everyone was gathering together. Children and adults all laughing and shouting. No one was in charge. But we all somehow formed two long lines up the road to welcome Geneva and Mama Binter in. The car swept them into the village and up to the hall. Mama Binter stepped out onto the pavement, wrapped in shawls and blankets. Everyone was cheering and clapping, and I guessed for probably the first time in her life, Mama Binter was utterly speechless. Geneva was waving madly through the window. I just watched as Mum and Hamish helped her out and into her wheelchair. I couldn't believe she was really here, in Scotland, in our village. 
Suddenly, I couldn't think of a thing to say. I backed away into the crowd. Callum McGregor, Mama Binter, was marching towards me. Callum McGregor, what are you doing hiding in there? She bored. You get your skinny backside out here. I was being pushed forward by the crowd towards Geneva and Mama Binter. Geneva was grinning and Mama Binter put her arms around me and gave me a bone-crushing hug. Well, Callum, she said, I've been looking forward to this day for a long, long, long time. Everyone was cheering and clapping again. I pushed the wheelchair, wheelchair and Geneva and I led the way into the hall. Chapter 43 Graham was right. It was a great party. Flint's girlfriend got everyone to find patterns and started calling the dancers. Mama Binter was up there swinging round on Hamish's arm. Rob and Ewan and some of the girls from school pushed Geneva round and round in the wheelchair. Music played, people late and drank and danced well into the night. The only person who wasn't there was Mr McNair. Mum had offered to give him a lift, but he didn't come. He told Mum he'd given up dancing a long time ago. I'm really sorry about this, Iris. I'm really sorry about Iris, said Geneva. Hamish told me. We sat beside each other at the back of the hall while the band worked the dancers faster and faster. I wanted to see her so much, I said. Geneva nodded. I kept looking into the sky today. I hope to see her on the way here. <laughs> I looked across at Geneva. It struck me how real she was. Not just a name at the end of an email. She was actually here right now, after all that had happened. I'm glad you're here, I said. Geneva smiled at me. She reached across and squeezed my hand tight. I am too. Dad flopped down in a chair next to us. Sweat was pouring down his face. Mama Binter can't half dance, he said. We looked across to see someone else twirl Mama Binter by the arm and whisk her away across the dance floor. You both look shattered, said Dad. It's gone twelve. Come on, you two. Let's get you home. I've got to check on the sheep anyway. Hamish drove us home. We huddled under coats in the chill night air. The mountains were blue-black against the midnight sky. A thin veil of mist circled the moon like a halo. Go on in and make yourselves a hot chocolate, said Dad. I won't be long checking the sheep. Hamish helped Geneva down from the Land Rover. Geneva propped her crutches under her arms. Look, she said. Do doctor say I can try to walk a little on crutches now? That's just amazing, smiled Hamish. He helped her across the stony yard to the kitchen door. Hamish, I said. He turned to look at me. Will you take us up on the hill tomorrow morning? Just us, I said. I promised to show Geneva the Irie. Hamish nodded. I'm working tomorrow, so it'll have to be early. We'll be ready, I said. I followed Geneva slowly into the kitchen. Do you want a hot chocolate? I asked. She nodded. I love hot chocolate, but I have it all the time at the hospital. She sat down at the table while I boiled the milk and stirred in the chocolate powder. She looked tired, her head propped in her hands, her eyes half closed. I felt tired too. It had been a long day. Here, I said, I pushed Mum's pile of laundry and Dad's paper to the side and put the steaming hot chocolate in front of her. I sat down and wrapped my hands around my moan mug, letting the warmth seep through me. I was so tired I felt I could have stayed like that, just staring into the steam. I watched it spiral slowly upwards. It made me think of Iris circling high in the sky. The swirling drift of steam stretched its feathery wings and flew in slow, lazy circles into the air. It rose higher and higher and brushed my face with the tips of its wings. It wheeled over the newspaper and iron shirts on the kitchen table. It soared across the white, buttoned mountains and worded valleys. It drifted towards me again. I wanted to hold it in my hands, hold it and keep it forever. I reached out my fingers, but it just slipped through them, dissolving into wispy threads and was gone. Geneva was looking at me, smiling. You know, she said, maybe you are like the marabout. Maybe the bird spirit. Maybe she flies to you too. Chapter 44. The last chapter in Skyhawk. I woke early the next morning. I got up from bed and peered out of the window. A fog had swallowed us up in the night. I couldn't see a thing outside, just bright whiteness. The farmhouse was strangely quiet and still. I slipped on my jumper and jeans and padded into the kitchen. Mum was getting breakfast things ready and Dad was sitting in a chair holding his hand in his ears, in his hands. Oh, I can't party like I used to, he groaned. Mum winked at me and put a plate of sausages and hash browns in front of him. Get that down here, she said. Feet sounded on the yard outside and Graham clumped in through the door. Shh, whispered Mum. 
Geneva and Mama Binta are still asleep. Graham sat down next to Dad. You can't see the nose on your face in that fog. He reached over and grabbed a sausage from Dad's plate. Can't let good food go to waste, he said, stuffing it in his mouth. Here they are, said Mum. I turned to see Mama Binta helping Geneva through the door. Mum pulled out a chair with a soft cushion and helped Geneva sit down. Geneva was dressed in what looked like about ten jumpers. A fleece, a pair of thick trousers, woolly walking socks and an old blue bobble hat. What do you think, Callum, she said. Am I ready for the mountains? I laughed. I think you'll make base camp on Everest in those. Mama Binta pulled her shawl around her shoulders and leaned against the warm cooking range. You won't find me up any mountains, she shivered. It's like living in a big freezer in here. There's no point going to the lock until after lunch anyway, said Dad. The fog might clear by then. But Dad, I said, it doesn't give us much time. Rob's mum and dad are taking Geneva out this afternoon to the woollen mills. And anyway, I was interrupted by a muffled engine arriving in the yard and headlights circled by fog. Hamish is here. Hamish knocked on the door and walked into the kitchen. Morning all, he grinned. He turned to Geneva and me. Are you ready to go and take a look at the Irie? We both nodded. Come on then, lass, said Hamish. We held out his hands to her. He held out his hands to her. Let's get you into the Land Rover. But they haven't had breakfast yet, Mum said. We'll have it later, I called. I've got to get something. I rushed up to my room to look for my binoculars. I hadn't used them since last year. I grabbed them from the top of the wardrobe and went back down to the kitchen. You won't see much with those, said Dad, as I went out of the door. The fog pressed against me, damp and heavy, as I crossed the yard. Geneva was already in the front seat. I opened the door and climbed in next to her. The crutches between us. The Land Rover rumbled into life and Hamish drove out of the yard and up the field track towards the lock. Sheep loomed out of the mist and stared at us as we passed. Hamish tried switching his headlights on full beam, but the glare bounced back at us. The track swung round the curve of the hill and started to climb steeply upwards. I think we've missed the track to the lock, I said. Hamish peered into the mist. Are you sure? I looked all around, but there was nothing but whiteness. No landmarks, nothing. I think so, I said. We shouldn't be climbing so steeply. The Land Rover side-slipped in the muddy track. I can't turn round yet, Hamish muttered. We'll go on. If I stop now, we might get stuck. He drove slowly on, bumping over the rock and stones. Geneva put her hands out on the dashboard to steady herself. Below my window, the edge of the track tumbled away into swirling mist. At least I can say I've been on the mountains, Geneva said, even if I can't see them. It's a bit brighter in front, said Hamish. The ground was flatter and covered by coarse grass. It was lighter and brighter all around. Colour had seeped into the world again. The outline of an orange sun pierced the mist above. Hamish edged the Land Rover on through the thinning whiteness and out into bright sunshine and blue sky as I sighed a sigh of relief. He turned the engine off and we sat in silence looking around as he whistled softly. You don't see something like this every day. The tops of the mountains above, the mist-filled valleys, pushed further into the sky. They rose like islands above a sea of white cloud. Please help me down, said Geneva. She was quiet, a slight frown on her face. I want to walk, she said. Hamish helped her down from the Land Rover. I passed her the crutches, but she shook her head. I must do this on my own. She spread her arms to steady herself, and slowly she took her first steps, one foot in front of the other. You're walking, I shouted. You're really walking. She stopped and turned to me and smiled the biggest smile. Look, Callum, she said. The marabout, he was right. Geneva stepped towards me through the mist-covered heather. The mist whirled around her feet like waves. She was walking above the world, across an ocean of bright cloud. I can see for miles and miles, she said. The mountains, they never end. Try these, I said. I tipped my binoculars out of their case. A small gold locket slithered on into my hand. It was Iona's locket. It lay open in my palm. Iona's vice. Iona's face, smiling out at me. And suddenly, it was as if Iona was with us there on the mountain. It was as if she'd always been there. I curled my fingers around the locket and held it in my hand. My eyes burned hot with tears that wanted to come. Here, I said. I put the locket into Geneva's palm. My friend would have wanted you to have this. I turned away and closed my eyes tight. 
but the tears came away, came anyway. I promised Iona that I would look after Iris. I tried my best. A lifetime ago, Iona and I had sat on this hillside, watching Iris fly over the Loch in Valley, and now I'd lost them both. I jumped when Geneva put a hand on my shoulder. Colangango, she said. I turned to look at her. Colangango? But Geneva said it again. Look, Callum. Colangango, she is coming. I wiped my eyes and stared through blurred tears, and there, above the sea of white cloud, flew a bird, its broad wings outstretched. It soared above us, its high call piercing the blue sky. Kay, kay, kay. An answering call came from the mist in the valley below. Osprey, I whispered. It banked around and flew close above our heads. I could hear the rush of air through feather tips. I knew it was Iris, I just knew it. I ran along the ground beneath her, my feet flying over the grass. I spread my arms wide like birds, wings and raced behind her in the shadow. She turned in flight and called again, Kee, kee, kee! And in that one brief, amazing moment, her bright sunflower yellow eyes looked right into mine. The end. Everybody loves a happy ending. It's a happy ending for both Geneva and Iris.